has ever gotten that quiet that fast when I've started talking, but it's great. Um, I'm Allie Katz. I'm the program coordinator here at the Writer's House. We're super excited to be hosting this program, this YA Authors in Conversation About Craft. I was to read the exact title of the program. Uh, and it's kind of in the middle of a week of accidental YA programming. We had Jason Reynolds, uh, you have watched the YouTube recordings of the fellows events from Monday and Tuesday. They were amazing. We had a ton of young people in the audience, which was just so mm -hmm. outstanding um, to have. Uh, so that was Monday and Tuesday. We have this amazing program today. And then tomorrow we have Eric Smith, who is an agent and also YA writer, and that's a lunch program. So. Excellent week if you're interested in writing for young people or being a young person who reads or <laughs> that whole spectrum. Um, and so you know, after the event, I believe that, that our, our writers here will sign some books. We have books for sale. Uh, we'll also have a reception. And in honor of the theme, uh, there will be some Tostino's pizza rolls. <laughs> there will also be like fancy cheese and grapes and all of that, but pizza rolls as well. <laughs> Uh, I want to make a couple thank yous. Uh, thank you to Nova Rensuma, uh, tonight's host and moderator, the organizer of this event. A lot of Nova fans here. Uh, an amazing author as well, as you all know. Uh, wrote A Room Away from the Wolves and the number one New York Times bestselling The Walls Around Us. Uh, and also a book about uh, edited in an anthology about YA craft, foreshadow stories to celebrate the magic of reading and writing YA. Uh, and she teaches here. So one more round of applause for her. <laughs> and I also want to, uh, this event is supported by the Lucy F. DeMarco Fund for Youth Literature, and it's established in memory of Lucy F. DeMarco, a preschool educator and lover of reading. Uh, it was endowed in her honor by Kathy DeMarco Van Cleve, who is here in the audience. So let's thank Kathy and Lucy for her love of books. A round of applause there. And thank you to our panelists, and thank you all for coming, and I'll hand it off to Noah. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone in the room here at Kelly Writer's House, and also welcome everyone who is watching on YouTube, live streaming this or watching later, so hi. Um, okay, so I want to thank Kelly Writers House for holding this event and allowing me the fantastic opportunity to have a craft-focused conversation about writing for young adults. Uh, because, I, you know, as some of us know, not all college writing programs embrace, you know, writing for young adults in this way um, and give it the respect and due that it deserves. So I'm excited that we can have this conversation here and that this can be a part of the program. Thank you to Ali Katz for our introduction and to Jessica Lowenthal for the invitation to be here tonight. Thank you to Heidi Kalu and everyone on staff involved with making this event happen. And I must also say thank you to Julia Block for reaching out and giving me this amazing opportunity to teach in this creative program. Uh, and one more thank you to my students, present and past, who are all here. There's a bunch of you here in the room today. And those of you in the advanced writing for young adults class know that many of the craft questions that we've been talking about this semester have inspired some of the questions on this panel. So I think hopefully that'll be an interesting discussion for everyone in the room, but I think especially some of you that I'm looking at right now. OK. So um, we are here to talk about the craft of writing YA novels. And I'm excited to ask these three talented YA authors questions about their process and their experience so we can all gain from their wisdom. I'm going to share our panelist bios, and then we'll hear from them a bit more about their latest book. First, um, you heard a little bit about me, so I don't have to go into a whole um, introduction, but I will say that my novels um, can be twisty in terms of genre, but they are all YA coming of age stories in some way. And in addition to teaching here at Penn, I also have taught in the MFA program for writing, in children, writing for children and young adults at Vermont College of Fine Arts um, and at Columbia University. And I've done a lot of workshops and retreats around the country focused on writing YA novels. So talking about this is something I love to do. 
So let me share with you the three celebrated authors we have here tonight. I will go this way. So Chloe Gong is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the critically acclaimed Secret Shanghai novels, as well as the Flesh and False Gods trilogy. Her books have been published in over 20 countries and have been featured in the New York Times, People, Forbes, and more. She is a recent graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, where she <laughs> double majored in English and international relations. Born in Shanghai and raised in Auckland, New Zealand, Chloe is now located in New York City, pretending to be a real adult. I relate. <laughs> Welcome back to campus, Chloe. Thank you. Yeah. Candice Elo is a first generation Nigerian American writer, dancer, and author of the 2020 National Book Award finalist and 2021 Prince honoree, Everybody Looking. They have performed their work around the country, most notably at the New Yorican Poets Cafe in New York City, the Women in Poetry and Hip Hop Celebration at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum in Baltimore, and as part of the Africa in Motion Performing Arts Series at the National Museum of African Art in Washington, DC. Competitively, they have advanced to the final rounds of the Graffiti DC Slam, Beltway Poetry Slam, and 11th Hour Poetry Slam. Candace is currently writing their third novel, Salt the Water, while touring their second, Break This House, which came out in May of last year. They live and work in Philadelphia with their cats, Maxine and Charlie. So welcome, Candace. And at the end of the table, Anika Mrose Risi is the award-winning author of more than a dozen books for kids and teens, including picture books, chapter books, middle grade, and YA. Her essays have been published by The Writer and The New York Times, and she plays fiddle in and writes lyrics for the band Owen Lake and the Tragic Loves. Anika grew up in Maine and spent many years in New York City, where she worked as an executive editor in children's book publishing, which is where our paths first crossed. She now lives in New Jersey with her very good dog, Sweet Potato. So welcome, Anika. <laughs> I, love, I love getting pet names, right? So thank you so much, Chloe, Candace, and Anika, for being here with us and talking about the craft of writing YA novels. Um, and so for the purposes of this conversation and this night, um, if there's anyone in the room who's like, what do you mean YA novels? We mean mostly books with, mo for the most part, teenage protagonists books that are aimed at an audience of teen readers, although we do know too that in the industry, um, you, the industry knows that many readers of YA books are not necessarily teenagers, okay? So I'm going to kick this off by turning to each of you and seeing if you might give us a sense of your latest YA novel, um, either now or upcoming, and ask you an opening question, what draws you to writing YA? So. Give us a sense of your latest book and tell us what draws you to writing YA. And I'll just go right next to me, okay, Chloe. Of yeah. course. Love to kick things off. Yeah. So hello. My latest YA novel, I guess I'll go back to like my proper release as opposed to my novellas, which recently came out. But uh, my last release was Foul Lady Fortune, which is a retelling of Shakespeare's As You Like It, set in 1930s Shanghai. It's about these two spies who go undercover um, while the Japanese empire is marching into the country. And they kind of have to uncover a conspiracy while, you know, fun things like being fake married and all of that <laughs> jazz, you know. Uh, so what drew me to writing YA is honestly quite a easy answer because I was a YA at the time I started. Um, I feel like the a lot of times the commercial aspect of young adult often gets forgotten when we talk about like, oh, will you write for teenagers and et cetera, et cetera. But Writing for teenagers was such a thing, like in the 2010s, right? Young adult had a huge boom yeah. and it was everywhere. And of course, as a teenager then, like that was all I read. Uh, so it was all I knew as well. When I started writing, I wanted to create the same feeling that all of these big blockbuster YA books gave me, right? You couldn't look anywhere without hearing about Twilight and The Hunger Games and Divergent, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that was where my first love of literature bloomed. And when I go into writing YA now, I'm thinking about how do those books make me feel? And that's exactly how I want my readers to feel. Mm, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my third novel, Salt the Water, comes out in October. 
Um, and it is another YA novel in verse, like everybody looking is, um, but it is uh, centered on a gender fluid teen named Cerulean Jean, who uh, is living in a post COVID society and has decided they no longer want to participate. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a story following um, this teenager who uh, just has these big dreams of living off the grid, going to California with their friends, and just imagining like this different world because they've just had enough of this, whatever this is. And um, of course, they get slapped by real world occurrences and pulled back into society via a, a family, family issue. Um, and something happens to one of the parents and um, suddenly the family needs Cerulean and all these real world problems come up like you need a diploma, you need a degree mm -hmm. to get this kind of job, you need to make money, but you've never had a job before. Um, and so it is an interrogation of all the institutions that young people are taught to trust, mm -hmm. um, but have harmed them over and mm -hmm. over again, failed them over and over again. Um, and I was drawn to write that book specifically because I am an adult who doesn't want to participate. <laughs> and so I know that teenagers are just like, what is this? I don't know what you're leaving us. Like, you know, everything that you guys have said about growing up is BS. Everything that you've promised us, promised us has been BS. Um, so I wrote this story for the same reason that I write YA, which is to say the things um, I was taught I wasn't allowed to say. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised in a house where... Um, I was taught how to perform and how to put on and how to be presentable um, and not not so much how to question things that just aren't working. Um, so Salt the Water is is going to be a, a chaos of a novel, um, but I wanted and I wanted to really give myself a shot to imagine like if we you know if young people did away with all of this well then what's next what is it that we're imagining what is possible um because this this just isn't it yeah that sounds so powerful and october you said salt october, the water october october i think october okay. 3rd is the okay. official pub date okay. um almost everything that i write from a picture book about running away to the moon, to a middle grade collection of spooky stories, to both of my young adult novels, um, in my heart and mind is about exploring the depths and the boundaries of different forms of love, whether that's familial love or um, friendships or um, romantic love. Um, and my most recent YA novel, Nobody Knows But You, is about a super intense friendship that forms over the course of a single summer and that summer is cut short by murder. And the story of that murder is um, unfolds through the psychological suspense of the novel um, in letters that one of the friends writes to the other the fall after um, and never sends, interspersed with text messages, um, other campers' testimonies to police um, and interviews with the media, social media posts, a trial transcript, um, news clips, things like that. Um, and I was drawn to tell that story and the other stories that I write for teens specifically um, because of the intensity of emotion and the intensity of experience in that stage of life. I remember vividly what it was like to encounter so many of those emotions deeply for the first time um, in a space where I had more independence than I had before. Um, and some stories call for being told in that space and in that way. And I, yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like that's what makes YA so exciting to explore as a writer and as a reader, yeah. that intensity. Uh, so thank you all for giving us a taste of, of your books out and upcoming. So I have um, questions about writing craft. I will also be leaving time at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions, hold on to them, and we will hopefully have time to get to certainly a few of them. So. Uh, you know, as I said, one of the classes that I'm teaching this semester is an advanced writing for young adults class. We're focusing on one YA novel throughout the whole semester. We actually meet like right upstairs. Uh, we were just there this afternoon. And so, uh, you know, as I said, some of the questions I'll be asking are stemming from some of the like craft questions that we've wondered in class, 
uh, some of the things that, you know, we're still exploring and I feel like are relevant to anyone who's writing a YA novel or perhaps a novel in general, but I feel like especially a YA novel. So that said, I'm going to start by talking about character because I feel like a character is so central to YA. It's what makes a story YA, what makes a, makes a book speak to the young adult audience in particular. So my question for you, uh, do you have any character building advice for those who are seeking to create nuanced and realistic characters in YA? If you have any strategies for building your, your teenage characters, uh, any advice for those of us who are trying to make sure that they feel authentic on the page? Um, should I start down at the end with Anika? How do you feel about that? Sure. Um, <laughs> for me, it's, it's partly, um, many of my characters I have that instant bond with that you feel with someone you, that you know you want to be friends with, but you don't actually know them yet. And so like in a real life friendship or relationship, spending a lot of time together is actually key to really actually getting to know the person, even if you feel like you have strong instincts with them together. So I often have to remind myself in my early drafts that even though I think I know this character's story, um, of course I don't know everything about her voice and her experience, yes, because we just haven't spent the time. Yeah. So giving yourself permission to really spend the time and knowing that in those early drafts, you won't know them as well as you will know them later. Um, so you will understand the specifics of their gestures and the ticks of their conversation and what, what their real motivations are much better once you've spent more of that time. So getting in there and writing what you know at first and then letting time pass, being, you know, spending time together every day, mm -hmm. having, having that person in your head and with your secondary characters as well. And over time, you'll get to observe them in different situations, notice things about them, yeah. just like with a regular person. Yeah. So uh, you know how people say, like, you know, you should really watch out for the people who are really quiet because they, you know, <laughs> they're, yeah. like, thinking something yeah. or they're plotting something. I am that person. Um, <laughs> I have always been an eavesdropper. Um, <clears throat> and I really love to people watch. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my character development comes from me watching everyone very closely. <laughs> um, and not in a, I mean, it sounds creepy. <laughs> it sounds really creepy, but it's my job. <laughs> um, but I really love to watch people and I love human beings. I love the way that we are when um, we're not performing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really love to capture young people on the page as uh, adults often do not know them. Um, the young person that is just mm -hmm. like feeling safe or feeling comfortable with their friends and the things that come up. And I worked really hard to be like, um, when I was teaching, I worked really hard to be a teacher that made the, the classroom feel safe so that my young people could feel safe saying the things that they really wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And so I have a history of like working with young people for 10 plus years. And a lot of the character development came from me thinking about my students and all of the young people I've spent time with. And I, from there, I let it kind of develop on its own. Like I think that um, a lot of us <clears throat> excuse me, come into writing projects kind of like with this idea of how our characters are going to be. But if you do it right, mm -hmm. they will take shape on their own um, and develop in the ways that, you know, you do in your own life. So in observing yourself and observing other people, um, that is how I started to just kind of like come up with a flow of what I wanted to present on the page. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of writers, or not writers, readers, uh, point out the way that I describe cis men in my work and I just get at a, a kick out of watching them and listening to them when they don't think that I hear what they're saying <laughs> um, and, and I think like observation is just like up here for me just yeah. because if um, someone's not performing you get to like pick up on all these little nuances of just being a human being and all of the like weird stuff that we don't usually get to to uh, I guess see on the screen when we're watching movies and shows and things like that so I really my character development comes around just observation and then also just trying to like look at the nuance in those moments so that way I can bring something fresh to the page mm -hmm. first I'm exactly the same I love people watching there's just so much fun in like 
zoning out when you're at a cafe and staring at someone you're like huh there are some really interesting little nuances that you're doing that actually speak to your character in a way that i can pick up knowing nothing about you random stranger in the cafe um but i think my favorite character i guess not advice but observation i've ever heard was from um roshni chokshi who wrote the golden wolves and mm-hmm. the star touch queen which is one of my absolute favorite books if you are ever looking for like good fantasy you have to read that uh but she said there is something about YA characters that feel sticky and I really like the way that she described that because there's something about YA especially where you feel so attached to that character in a way that not to say adult doesn't do that but sometimes it's not so much the priority as it is when you're writing for young adults it's sticky you touch it and it you go away with it right Um, And when I think about, you know, when I sit down, I think, how do I write a sticky character? A lot of times it's, you know, observation about exactly the same, looking at how people go through life and what can you put on the page that shows you something about them. Um, But then another route I kind of take is to carve inside myself, which sounds a bit gruesome, but you kind of look at what is it that makes you feel strongly about something. Mm -hmm. And as you're creating the character, what is it that you put in yourself that feels real that someone else will read this and think oh I know exactly what that is like it's this inherent human condition right everyone kind of feels the same kinds of anger or jealousy those emotions you might not feel it the same way as everyone but everyone alive feels that Uh, which is not to say that you should write self-insert characters right there's all of that discourse as well like don't write characters that are exactly like you because then someone's going to criticize it and you're going to feel really hurt because they're actually just criticizing you uh not speaking from experience by the way (laughs) i swear i really swear Uh, (laughs) but if you take a bit of something that you know is true that you have observed in your real life and then you kind of build fiction around that Mm -hmm. it is still a fictional character but at the end of the day you know there's a piece of that character that's real because that is what you put of yourself in there and no one can ever say like, well, they could. <laughs> no one could ever say, oh, this is unrealistic because at the core of it, there's a little, little kernel of truth. And if everything's kind of building off of that, you know, there's a thread in there that is what you're trying to go for. And I think that's how it makes it sticky. You touch it and you're like, I recognize this. And you walk away with it following you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, I love that. <laughs> I feel like I have so many new ideas for thinking of, of characterization. Uh, so... Okay, so whenever I talk to authors, I always want to ask about their process because, um, you know, you get into writing, you know, a writing rhythm, you get into a way of like, I do it this way, um, this is how it works for me, and sometimes you get stuck, sometimes things don't work, you know, we especially get stuck in the middle of a book, we get, you know, like, there's just all the, all the ways that sometimes your methods aren't working, and so I think it's really interesting to just dive into different processes and see how other authors do it, and perhaps think of ways that you might try things differently. So when I think, when we think of plotting and planning a novel, you know, the question I get asked a lot is, do you need to outline? You know, can you write without knowing where you're going? You know, do you do a mix of of that? And we all have our own ways of approaching that. So I was wondering if we could share some of our process here, you know, on this panel so we could see how these authors approach their novels with, I feel like, the caveat that sometimes different novels want different processes, right? Isn't that true? So whoever wants to jump in and start and share how things work for you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, again, agreed. Uh, every single book that I've, every book that I've written has had a distinctly different process. And um, unlike sort of uh, what you were just describing, my stuff is very internal. Mm. Um, And so it usually, um, it usually is a process that correlates with my own life and something that I have to figure out. For example, um, you guys are going to have a great time with Salt the Water because... (laughs) it is not the kind of ending that you might expect or that Mm. you might desire. And that is Mm -hmm. because it's something we've never seen before. And I am dealing with myself and not knowing the answers to a lot of the questions that I was presenting Mm. as well. And so my process usually um, has a lot to do with, one, I always choose like 
a time that feels like natural to me to work on that particular story. Mm -hmm. Everybody looking, I wrote all over New York City at all different times of day on everybody's computers. <laughs> it was just a mess. Um, but if you've read Everybody Looking, you know that it's kind of put together in a nonlinear way as yeah. well, um, similar to how my brain had to function to put that story together. And so early on, I really learned that I have to lean into whatever it is that feels the best and easy to my brain. And so sometimes mm -hmm. that meant writing at four in the morning between four and seven. Break This House was written um, between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. every day for a summer. Huh. Um, and it was gnarly. It was really terrible. Um, I like my sleep, but it was, it was also the time when all the demons came out. And if you've read Break This House, Break This House is a grief story um, about a teenager who is grieving um, her mother, who, is, who was estranged. They didn't have a good relationship. They had a lot of problems. Um, but the grief hit really, really hard. And so I found that my sadness, the darkness, the, the quiet, all of those thoughts that come up when you are grieving a person, it was late at night. It was those morning hours. And so I kind of let myself fall apart. And I kind of let myself just kind of word vomit. There are certain stories that you kind of just have to start with all the feels and then you come back and you reel it in and you're like, okay, what's the story here? Um, and so that's the process with Break This House. Break This House was, it had more structure. I came to the, to the desk every day um, for a certain amount of time, but it was late at night and it was really messy and there were a lot of things that I wrote down that didn't make the book because it just got dark and I allowed it to do that. Whereas um, Salt the Water, this is the first time in my life, like Salt the Water has been written over the past six years or so, and but I wrote most of the book last summer. And this is the first time I actually have a writing routine period, like where I'm like, okay, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. every day, I'm going to sit at my desk. Whatever happens, happens, that's fine. And then later on, I'm going to deal with the revision. Um, but that was to Salt the Water... Uh, is another YA novel in verse, which is another puzzle. And so there isn't really, I really wish I had like, um, kind of like a, a roadmap kind of description of how you put together a novel in verse, but it's a newer form yeah. that uh, I would hope that each person who approaches it, you're bringing yourself, you're bringing your own form, you're bringing some type of innovative approach to it. And I've had to do the same thing with Salt the Water. It's my most imaginative. And so I've had to do a couple of things like I've had to um, I did like I went on a trip to kind of ground myself in the kind of city um, that I wanted to describe same thing with break this house break this house I went to Detroit for like a week um, because I wanted a certain type of city but I didn't want to go back to the city that I grew up in mm. um, and so someone was just like pick a city that reminds you of that go there immerse yourself in it ask questions and um, it was all a mess until like probably the f last month of writing it, right? Like I wish I could say I had this perfect outline and then I wrote chapter one and then I wrote chapter two and then I wrote chapter three. But it was never like that. I, I started to realize that sometimes in order to start the book, you start with the only scene you can see. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, for example, Break This House, the scene that started that story isn't even in there. Like it came from a dream that I had um, where it was just like a break in in my head and that's where the title came from. And then I, it, it was my agent that told me later on, she was like, this isn't the story you told me you were writing at all. <laughs> um, and that was when I really started to realize like at some point in the process you come in with these ideas um, and then at some point you really just let go. Yeah. And you allow the story to take over on its own. And um, I had a lot of... Uh, writing like coaches and mentors who said that to me over the years and I didn't understand it until I came to break this house and I just didn't know what to do and I did have an outline for break this house and then I had to abandon it halfway through mm -hmm. and it was it was my outline that actually was slowing me down it was my editor that was like it's your book you can trash mm -hmm. the whole thing like nobody knows that you wanted to end it like this mm -hmm. and so uh, I think like this question of process comes up in all of these events. And I think 
always the point is like, oh, you know, help me figure out how my process is going to be. But I really don't think I can help you do that. <laughs> I really genuinely don't think that I can help you do that because it's rooted in um, what feels good in your body. It's rooted in when your mind is flowing. It's rooted when you feel inspired. It also is rooted in when you don't feel inspired because deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a lot that comes into it, but it, it, it is rooted in knowing yourself and knowing um, what brings the most out of you. Mm -hmm. Like if writing at a desk does nothing for you, then don't write at a desk. Mm -hmm. If writing every day doesn't work for you, don't write every day. If you write one day a week and you're just bursting, go with it. Like go with the thing that feels really weird, but really right. <laughs> so so important to hear and also to like to to realize sometimes we hold on so tightly say to an outline or to a plan or to a method and knowing how important it is sometimes to let go and then the story emerges mm -hmm. it's just and i i think it's so beautiful that each of your books had such an individual specific process as if you were living the it through the writing um okay Let's let's hear more about process. Who who wants to go next? So it's it's really funny like for me to go next because I'm about to be very pro outline. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's especially um, this is something that is so relevant because I was at Penn like as I was going through these novels where I really had to stick to an outline because I was writing and revising exclusively from like. 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. because that was when I finished my assignment work, right? I had to get all the classwork out of the way. I had to turn in those assignments. Canvas was due at 11.59, like I got that <laughs> in. And then I was like, okay, it's writing time. And the thing that happens when you are very short on time for creative work is that you suddenly realize you can't waste a second of it. Um, and I will put out the disclaimer, this does not work for everyone. So do not go back to your dorm and think, Chloe Gong did it like this, I'm gonna do it like this. Don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> but all to say, a lot of the times if you are like a student writer especially and you find that you sit down with your manuscript and you're kind of just staring off into space because you're like, oh, I don't know what happens <clears throat> next. The way that I combated that was anytime I was like just going about life, like if I was going to print and like buying something, I was percolating the story in my head. And then the outline became this like, you know, it became a way to really strictly say, all my thinking time is when I don't have those free hours to write. But when I do have that, you know, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., that is solely writing time or else I'm not going to get this novel done or else I'm not going to meet the deadline or else the revision's not going to be finished because there's always going to be something more important when you're a student. Yeah. There's always going to be that next assignment you have to do. There's always going to be a reading you probably should catch up on. There's always <laughs> going to be like, oh, well should I skim this reading or like, should I actually do it and then not have writing time? Sorry if that was too real. Um, but that was what I found worked for me because if I had that outline, I could sit down when I did have, you know, free time and immediately go, okay, this is what I'm doing for the next chapter. All that time would end, 1 a.m. would hit and I, I'd be like, okay, I can actually go to bed now because, you know, I did finish it. Is that my phone vibrating? Sorry. <laughs> um, but... I do recommend outlining if you are a busy person. And as we all know, like when you do have to prioritize school in front of everything, it, that's just what happens sometimes. But of course, with the caveat, you can't force creativity. Even if you do have an outline, sometimes it doesn't work. And if you do know exactly what you're sitting down to write, sometimes the words also just don't come. Uh, so, you know, my process has changed a lot since graduating as well. Once you become like a full-time writer, you suddenly find like, oh God, I have so much time now. And you have to reorganize your entire process. So I had that um, identity crisis last year where I was suddenly thinking, okay, I can't mash up everything in two hours anymore. And I was wasting more time. So I actually outlined a bit less. Uh, so, you know, things change with every book. Find what works for you. But my top piece of advice on process is if you are a very busy person, outlining can really help focus um, you when you have short amounts of time. Awesome. I love the contrast between, and also <laughs> like, isn't it true when you have the amount of time that you have, it just like, it balloons to what you have. So you have two hours, you have you have 20, and somehow it's never enough yeah. time. Yeah. At least that, that's, that's how it is for me. Yeah. So Anika, what about your process? Yeah, I'm going to sort of slide between those two. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, but as you're hearing from all of us, process is fluid and process is highly individual. And it's not, oh, I figured out my process and now here's how I write a book. It's here's what's working for me right now on this project. 
and continuously checking in with my process is part of my process. Um, I do not outline, nor do I go in with no sense of what I'm doing. I spend much more time thinking than writing, both before I begin and as I'm drafting. I believe in very small achievable goals that I can set for a day, for a week, for a month in order to be able to meet those goals, which is very important to me psychologically in an ongoing project where you're just never done. So how is it enough? Yeah. Um, so that's part of my solution to the too busy to something. Well, if my goal for today was to write 200 words, which actually is my goal often as I'm drafting something, by the time I've met, I can keep going if I want to, but I really am done when I've hit those 200 words. And sometimes that takes me 30 minutes and sometimes that takes me all the hours I have in a day. Um, but knowing that having that sense of completion can allow me to move on and moving away from the computer screen or the clipboard with the dog in the park um, is a really important part because like I said, more of my time is spent thinking than is spent writing. Um, one thing that worked really well for me um, with the last novel I tried writing was to set my alarm 20 minutes early for the fuzz on the radio, right? A, a radio, a clock radio, but set not to a station so that when it went off, I wasn't having any sounds that would make me think of anything else. It was just that, Ooh. right? And I would hit, smooth, hit snooze. And while I wasn't fully awake, I would try to think about my book. And sometimes I would fall asleep and then it would go off 10 minutes later. I think, But sometimes I would start thinking, okay, summer camp, what are there? There's canoes. What if we were on a <laughs> canoe? And, right, because half of being able to write a yeah. book is to trick myself into thinking about it when it doesn't have that pressure on it. Yeah. And so I'm not even awake yet. This is going to be nonsense. But if I can get my brain into the book, then, ooh, Maybe, a con maybe I'll overhear a, a snippet of a conversation that might go, or a character might show me some of her thoughts about something, or I might even just think of a scene I hadn't included, um, just actual scene of, right, canoes, there's a lake here, what, are, what do we do with that at camp? Um, and then I can scribble that on the notebook that I keep next to my bed in every jacket pocket in all of my bags in every mm -hmm. room of my house. And then I'll have snippets of little things I've scribbled throughout the day as I'm thinking. And when I do go sit at that desk to write those 200 words, I have some things to type up first right? Because I can type up my messy notes and then it gives me places to start writing. So mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time thinking, a little bit of time writing. I revise constantly as I go. Mm -hmm. um, and I constantly am changing what works or what doesn't work. Sometimes the tricking myself into writing means I do need to take a clipboard to the dog park and I'm not really writing. I'm just at the, at the dog park and on this clipboard, I'm not even going to write my first person novel I'm going to write in third person they might go to this and say this to each other right then you're it takes the pressure off I'm not trying to write the scene it's not in this voice but it gives me something to start with mm -hmm. when I go and go back and need to do it so a lot of being very kind and generous and forgiving with myself and sort of weaseling my way toward something but I like to know um a little bit of where I might be going in a book um, so a few of the points I might hit, a few of the scenes that might be in there, and I don't necessarily know where they'll go or if they'll stay, um, but the thinking leads me to those, and then I can kind of slowly squirm toward them. Mm -hmm. I think it's so valuable to to acknowledge that the thinking part of this process is important too. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can. I know that I can beat myself up when I have I haven't got on all the words down on the page. Only the writing matters. But really, what we're puzzling through in our minds subconsciously when we're half asleep or yes. when we're doing other things, mm -hmm. it's all <laughs> valuable and get, getting into the manuscript and helping us figure out the novel. And I I love that you prioritize that. The backs of our brains know more about what we're doing creatively than the fronts of our brains. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was recently talking with some other writers about how, you know, one of the things that drives me wild in my own process is why am I wasting all of this time doing side research on something that won't matter, mm. right? Like yeah. looking up the sex life of bees <laughs> <laughs> for my book about middle school in school like right but so that I get this 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 detail right in this sentence that will probably be, get cut right um why do I spend two hours on that when I should be spending those two hours focused in writing and I've decided that the reason I spend the two hours on that is I know I'm not ready to move forward yet there's something else I don't know what I don't know is not the sex life of bees, although I don't know that it's true. I need to look it up. But while I'm looking that up and thinking about something tangentially related maybe to this sentence, 
the back of my brain can work on the stuff I do need to figure out about these characters, about this plot, right? And But I need to stay enough in the story without staring at the thing I don't have yet. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the ways to do it. So same thing with the alarm clock going off early and making noise. And okay, well, I'm not really writing it. I'm still in bed. Mm-hmm. But I can mm-hmm. sort of think around it mm-hmm. and let the not, not conscious part of my brain do some of that work. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. I'm going to start doing the alarm clock thing. Do the alarm clock thing. <laughs> we should all try yeah. it. Yeah. And, okay. you know, worst case scenario, you get a little more sleep. You yeah. just right. you <laughs> It's fine. Um, so I'm curious about um, those in the room and those who can hear me. Um, how, who among you here has been started a YA novel, started writing a YA novel? Yay. So many. That's wonderful. <laughs> Anyone hasn't yet but is thinking that perhaps you might be writing a YA novel in the future? Possibly. Okay. So we have a lot of people who this is, you know, a possible aspiration and something, you know, to that may be in their future. So I wonder if we have any advice for, you know, writers who are hoping to enter this this world of publishing, this YA industry. Um, was there anything you knew you wish you knew when you were an aspiring writer, or do you have any, you know, industry advice that you might offer someone new? So whoever wants to, to jump in and, and take that. <sighs> I felt that. <laughs> so how long do we have? <laughs> Two hours? <laughs> yeah. I mean, nothing could have prepared me mm. for the fact that they're out here banning books like mine right now. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. My editor has literally told me to be prepared for Salt the Water to be flagged for it. So I think my advice really is to know who you are as you're going into this Mm -hmm. um, because there are contracts I'm not signing that colleagues are signing. Mm -hmm. And it's because they don't have certain things at stake. You know what I mean? I have contracts that have come across my desk many times and like people like, oh my God, you passed that up. That was this, that was this uh, publisher. That was this. And I was just like, yeah, but they, they were about to sanitize my story though. Mm -hmm. Like they, you know, me being a black queer writer and making sure that my characters are authentic to that experience is more important to me than just you know, somebody just giving me a book deal and like, oh, I'm, you know, I got another book coming out. Um, There's a lot of, there's just, I just think it's really important um, when we have these big dreams to really understand what's important to you before you go into it, what you will say yes to and what you absolutely won't say yes to um, because book contracts are serious like other contracts are. And, um, I think a lot of people think like, oh, you just, you know, you sign this contract and immediately the money's going to come right then and da da da. And it's like, no, they'll be like, you can get a little bit when you turn <laughs> in the book. And then you can get a little bit when you revise it. And then maybe you can get a little piece on pub day. And then maybe you'll get the rest six months later. Like that's, that's a real timeline. Mm-hmm. You know That's what I'm very saying? realistic. But it's that revision real piece is going to be three mm-hmm. months later than you thought because your editor was busy, so yep. she couldn't give you the notes mm-hmm. for you to revise. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that happened. Yeah. I mean, I literally have waited for an editor for two months when I was ready to go. Mm-hmm. And then the timeline was pushed back because they weren't ready. Mm-hmm. And so there's just a lot of unexpected things that come up. And I think that I just, I just lean in on focusing on knowing who you are, knowing what it is that you came to do, what mm-hmm. you really want to write about, like get clear about your convictions. Um, don't sign just about everything. The money looks huge, but it's not over the course of five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you, you've never seen that amount of money on a contract, mm-hmm. but then it's like, oh, you don't get it until these times. Well, your book, the process from... Uh, getting the contract all the way down to it coming out could be a five years. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I also included in that is like um, not quitting your job immediately when you see that money, when you see these offers and you see these opportunities um, and really pacing yourself and having a good understanding of what you came to do and not just kind of getting just like 
swept up in all of the excitement of it because being a YA author is very exciting. Like writing for young people is just one of the most rewarding things I've ever done, I feel. Um, but my principles really do matter. Mm -hmm. And if you write YA, you write children's books, like kids are watching you. Mm -hmm. Kids are really watching you. They're eating up what you're saying. Um, and it is a very important job. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really, there's a lot that I was not prepared for. Um, I also was not prepared for all of the things I would have a say in, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when I first got, uh, when I first decided that I wanted to be a writer full time, um, I was talking to Jason Reynolds, he's my mentor. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him about it and he was like, yeah, like I told him, I was like, oh yeah, I think I want my cover to be like this and I want it to feel this way and da da da. And he was like, slow down, you probably won't even get to pick that. And I was like, it's my book. Like I don't get to choose my cover, are you serious right now? Yeah. And it is, it is one of those things that I actually did get a lot of say. I got, you know, I had an editor who really is creative. Um, my editor is really cares about the art of the whole entire process and so, you know, he did ask me, like, what do you envision? Do you see a face on the cover? Do you see a body? What colors? Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. um, and that process for everybody looking was super fun because I got to send him dance videos. I got to send him all these pictures and movies and shows. Like, I got to give him homework. Um, <laughs> and it was really cool to see it all come together because of that. And, I, and, and from the beginning, I had been told I wouldn't have that. Mm -hmm. And so... Coming into it also, I think it's really important to have great vision. Don't let anybody tell you um, that you're not going to have a say. Like Authors who have a vision are more likely to have a say in their process. But if you come in like, oh, I just want my book published, that's not a good look. You know, mm -hmm. because anything could happen. Like, And I think that it's really important to insert yourself wherever you feel strongly. So that way you can be proud of what you put out and not... Um, just be pressed to have a book out, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that having a book out isn't, or publishing isn't, um, it's a wonderful thing, but it also is a job like anything else. Yeah. And so I think it's really important to just kind of like get clear, like what is it that I'm trying to do? What is it that I want for my career? What is it that I'm trying to say? What do I feel strongly about? What don't I care about? Like there's gonna be lots of opportunities for you to negotiate and put your principles out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it's a fight sometimes because there are plenty of authors who don't care and they'll just, you know, they'll sign whatever. Um, so I'm, I think I'm speaking very specifically to um, black and brown queer writers, mm -hmm. particularly right now, um, just because it is, it is um, tempting to be like, you know, maybe I won't go there in the story. Or maybe I'll take this word out of the synopsis. And it's just like, mm, mm, what, what are you about at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. I think that's really important to think about. Um, and all the other stuff is going to be very specific to your path because I was told a lot of things um, that would happen that didn't happen. And then I was told a lot of things that couldn't happen for me that have. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. Anyone else? advice for those who want to write YA and publish it? I think when I think about approaching publishing specifically, the greatest piece of advice I'd give, like maybe, you know, to my debuting self is that you need to remember the writing is actually the part that you're most in control of and everything else. Yes, you might have some bit of control, but so much of it, so much of publishing and so much of young adult publishing specifically is going to come down to luck, to the market, and to what other elements are currently going on. Uh, and I like, especially really had this realization moment throughout most of my like first and second year as a published author, because so many media questions were asking me, what did you do to make your book a success? Because people started pitch like pitching me as the first like book talk author right the one who was actually on it as opposed to you know the newest wave of book talk making old bestsellers big again and it was always really hard to answer that because what I really did was I just happened to be online at the right time like yes I was creating content that I was you know enjoying and other people enjoying it too like I'm not going to discount myself by saying that I didn't know what I was doing 
I went in very clearly trying to market at a time where the pandemic had shut down all the bookstores, right? This was the one way that I knew that I could market myself. That being said, it was also just the timing. Like if that hadn't been the exact set of circumstances, maybe the book wouldn't have done how it did. If it hadn't been like book talk suddenly, you know, surged up into existence and I met the gold rush before it happened, it would be a whole different set of circumstances. And all that to say, like, you need to put in hard work for publishing. You need to write the book as well as you can. But then there are so many other factors that are so uncontrollable. Like YA will wash through trends like nobody's business. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> like a few years will pass and they'll suddenly be like, oh, no, we're not publishing any of these. And two years ago, they were buying so many, right? Uh, so there's really no way to control like this is definitely going to do well this is definitely going to sell well even when publishers and editors promise that it is never something they can promise they can promise that you're a lead title they can throw like so much marketing behind you it can still flop if the market isn't behind it Um, so nothing is in your control except writing the book that you want to write writing that piece of art that you wanted to create and everything else is just like you just hold on to that little piece of driftwood and go with the tide Mm -hmm. but put your heart into it yes put your heart heart into into your book it's worth it the readers that you find Mm -hmm. make it worth it Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I think that making good art is about paying exquisite attention to what you love in the world and why and following your individual oddities. Um, Chloe individual was ta- oddities. Yeah. That's wonderful. Chloe was talking about this with creating a character, right? We all have universal emotions that we experience, mm. that we experience them in specific ways. Mm. And when you connect with a book or a character, you're not connecting with the general things about that character. All the specific things about that character make you see specificities in yourself, right? Mm. The, the universal is found in the specific. Um, so find what's weirdest about you. Right. Show us show us the world the way that only you see it. Um, even when you're telling the same story that's been told before, what, what is it about mm-hmm. about you in that story and your voice in that story and your character in that story? Because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you can't control the rest of it, but you can really amuse yourself. Important advice. Um, I'm looking at the time and I think we should open up to Q&A right now um, instead of all these other questions that I have. So, I mean, I have lots of questions, but perhaps you have questions. I don't know if there's a mic or something or, yeah. So is there anyone who has a question for any, you know, the authors on the panel who would like to, you know, see what we think? Yeah. How did you become, oh, thank you. Um, How did you become a full-time writer and how did you make a living off of it? Like, how did you get yourself out there and start making a living? The practical thing. So (laughs) how how to, and and some of us may not be full-time authors, but how did we become full-time authors if we are and how do we make a living? I feel like that could be like an hour-long conversation. (laughs) Does anyone have any, you know, anything to offer on that? I mean, I will say for me, Um, sometimes the choice of being a full-time author isn't necessarily the right choice because the pressure of that um, with a book deal is extraordinary. It's like your art is now the way you pay your rent Mm -hmm. and the way you pay your utilities and your credit cards, right? It's overwhelming. Um, So I found that um, balancing that out with something that fed my writing really was a better choice for me and that's why I'm here teaching part-time at Penn because I feel like it's a it's better for me mentally, creatively, and um, you know, in terms of overwhelm, I think it's a, a better balance. Mm-hmm. But um, does anyone have a, an answer to to this about full time writing and making a career making a career of writing? I suppose. I think it's about considering a lot of factors, right? It's about considering whether, just on a very practical level, the amount that you can reliably count on coming in every year is going to keep you alive. (laughs) Um, I had a bit of a strange situation because when I, I'm an international, well, I was an international student, which meant when I graduated, I could either decide to get a, like a day job or I could decide to go full time. And I couldn't do both because mm-hmm. legally the government says I can either get one visa or the other. I can't do both at the same time. Uh, so I kind of, it's a situation that I'm sure not like most people in this room are probably not going to relate to, but I kind of had to take that one or the other leap because of visa reasons. And the the reason why I was able to take that leap was because, you know, my first book came out, my 
uh, first semester of senior year, which meant I had about six months before I graduated. And I was like, okay, if I look at the advance money that I have reliably coming in for my next contract, and then if I look at what royalties are next going to come in, if I add that up, and it looks like I'm not going to starve to death, then yeah. that is something that you know I can reliably do. But you also have to look at things like self-employed people have to pay really high health insurance. Um, there are other things to consider, like, you know, do you have debt to pay off? Do you have family members relying on you? And every author's situation is so different. And this is not something that people talk about that much, right? You never know if someone is, you know, completely free of debt. And you never know if someone has a lot of, like, income going somewhere else, like, you know, supporting family members, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's really hard to like do that comparison game of, oh, well, like going full time means you're more successful. It absolutely does not. You know, there are so many things that go into it. And, you know, for me, I was really lucky because when I graduate, I'm like, I'm just one person. Right. I don't have people to take care of. I'm just if I move to New York and I look at my rent, like, can I do this? And that was all I had to think about. But for a lot of other people, there are so many factors that, you know, when you have your advance split into like four parts and some publishers are doing five parts now, which is mm-hmm. horrendous, uh, that advance money is not advance anymore. A lot of it is a, a fraction. And then there are taxes. Don't even get me started on taxes. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot to consider. Um, but at least in my personal experience, it was kind of looking at the pros and cons and can I do this? And if I couldn't, then I would have had to like do a day job. And I was like, I really don't want to go into corporate America. Um, so that was, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, the practicalities, um, just as your process is fluid as a writer, your finances are fluid as a writer. (laughs) Yep. I have years where I've made one tenth of what I've made in other years, and mm-hmm. sometimes it's predictable and sometimes it's not. Mm-hmm. I have a partner with a steady income and I have health insurance through that partner, and this <coughs> system we have here stinks and is super unequal, and take a real look at your own circumstances and what's allowed, and like Nova was indicating, what adds more stress to your creative work mm-hmm. or removes the stress from your creative work. And then, as you're hearing a lot of us saying, you don't necessarily spend all day writing even if you're a full-time writer. So do you need that time? Is it just the idea of being a full-time writer? Mm -hmm. Or will that actually give Mm -hmm. you something? And for some people, maybe it will give you something and let you be Mm -hmm. um, more productive. But there's no failure in having other work. I have other work right now. And Mm -hmm. um, you'll you'll have times when, when lots coming in and you'll have times when very little is coming in and how much hustle is going to work for you. Mm -hmm. And the only right answer to that is what's right for you. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? I see some hands up. Um, this question is for Chloe Gong specifically, but as an international student myself, I'm really curious seeing your diverse cultural background, like how specifically has your Asian cultural experience influenced your writing and coming up with new ideas? I mean, it's absolutely influenced a large amount of it. I think when I went into publishing, It was a little better than it was, you know, when I was reading Young Adult, uh, because, you know, there were movements like we need diverse books and there was a lot of work already put in before I got into it. But it is still quite dire out there. Um, And to me, it's not only about being influenced to write these things that I want to see. It's all it's also the things that I write are like it's it's so important to me that they actually you know, mean something to people. It could be the first time they've seen themselves like represented on the page. It could be the first time they've seen like their particular background, like, you know, in a historical setting or in some sort of like cultural storyline, right? Um, But it is not easy, right? Because if you are, you know, among some of the first to do something, there's a lot of doubt in, should I even do this at all? Is this going to impact how my work is received by the majority? Is this going to, you know, speak for the entire culture that I'm writing about? Because, you know, you know how it is. If there's not that many stories out there, it suddenly becomes taken as the one truth. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, those were a lot of things that I considered. But at the end of the day, like it was so important to me to write something that felt true to the story that I had imagined. And, you know, with the books that I have right now, like I just love Shanghai and its history so much. My parents are 
obsessed about you know talking about it and they're always bragging to their relatives like did you know that my daughter did this <laughs> um so it like the end result is really worth it to me because there's 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 honoring like that tradition i come from and then there's kind of sharing that with readers who just you know are finally seeing it or just readers who are also being introduced to it for the first time and really loving it as well and it all just feels exactly like what I'm trying to do like as a writer and that's kind of what I'm coming back to always so yeah big influence <laughs> thank you um I think I saw a question over here yeah and then I went over there could we yeah, get the mic yeah yeah thank you Hi, so um, I just had a general question more about like the writing process. So um, I think like when I write, um, I get really excited about the beginning and the end. And then there's kind of like that middle period. And I'm kind of like, okay, like how do we get from points A to C with B? Um, so I was wondering if any of you guys could talk about that middle process, like the middle of your writing process and how you overcome writer's block. I'm so glad you asked that. I had like these list of questions and middles was on there because like so many writers, it's where we get stuck, right? Yeah. yeah, so thank you for saying that, for asking that. And whoever wants to take this, yeah. So my theory on writer's block is just in general um, that writer's block is like our fear of writing badly. Mm -hmm. Like we want to have the things to say before we come to the page. Mm -hmm. And I find that I struggle with the middles as well. And that's usually the time that I am just, I, I've gotten this idea in my head that I know what the story is about. And so if I don't write it down like this, then it's not going to work. Um, and I think that in, the, in, a, in moments like that, I oftentimes just step away. Like writer's block or writer's block or feeling stuck, I feel usually for me is a sign that I need to let the work breathe for a second mm -hmm. or that I've just been spending too much time in my head or um, I haven't been living, you know, like you really have to have a full life to have something to say also. And I forgot that as a writer <clears throat> pretty quickly. I felt like, oh, to be a good writer, I need to be writing all the time. I need to write every day. I will, you know, I need to just be pumping out all these words. And um, I forgot that I really needed to be like eating really well, seeing friends, having problems, solving problems. Mm -hmm like you know getting messy in life um, in order for me to have something for that middle part because the middle mm -hmm. part usually is where the conflict is being worked out mm -hmm. and so there is just a lot of living that needs to happen and if you if you a lot of times it's between us needing to live and give it some breath or we're just so in our heads about perfection um, that we're not allowing ourselves to just write blah, blah, blah. and then she walked through the door and then she jumped in the lake. And then, like, you know, you literally can write whatever you want in those moments mm -hmm. and then come back and let it become something else. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like ultimately writer's block is that. Writer's block is, like, I don't want to write trash, so I don't know what to write. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's yeah. just, like, you literally could write Goo Goo Glee Glock on there. <laughs> and then you're writing, you know? Yeah. Anyone else on figuring out the middle? I mean, that is always the hardest part for me. Yeah. The beginning tends to have a lot of questions and excitements that you're following. Yeah. And the ending has some obvious answers and mm -hmm. the excitement of wrapping things up. And often in the middle, I need to tap into more questions, new questions to keep myself excited and engaged. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering this thing. I've written to a certain point of it. What else am I wondering? What else am I excited about? What else have I discovered in those early pages. So I do a lot of, as I mentioned, revising as I go. Part of that is perfectionism and moving slowly and being unable to just write gobbledygook on the page. <laughs> um, but part of that is I really love sentences and finding worth it, right? L tapping into that, that thing that I love and letting myself do that in the process of refining this sentence that might get cut and doing that research that might not go in there because those things light my brain up and keep me excited. And in the process of doing them with those early pages that I'm revising and revising and revising as I move forward, I'm tapping into, ooh, I noticed this thing I did that was just the thing I wrote that he said, but now what if that carries mm -hmm. through here, right? Finding those moments that 
interest to me about what I already have on the page and following those interests into the questions that it raises mm -hmm. to develop more in the middle because often there's not enough happening in that middle mm -hmm. to keep you engaged but also your initial excitements have left and you should just continuously have more questions for yourself as you're writing a novel um, to keep you going. Those initial qu questions will not carry you through a whole novel. Mm -hmm. Just as a quick addition to that, I subscribe to a philosophy called give yourself a little treat. <laughs> I'm gonna write that. Yeah, every single chapter, that's what I think. I'm gonna give myself a little treat, right? So it's how I get through like soggy middle syndrome because so often the problem is that you get bored, you can't see where you're going or you can't understand how you reach beginning to end, right? Mm -hmm. But as long as I have, like, give myself a little treat philosophy, every single chapter has something that I'm excited to get to. And even if it doesn't quite make sense yet, all you need is the words on the page before you can go back and revise it and make it make sense. But as far as keeping yourself motivated, like, just drop the little. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question. Thank I think you. I saw over here. Yeah. Um, hi, as um, a reviewer and someone who's followed the industry for like say the last five years or so, um, I've noticed there's been a rise of YA with adult crossover appeal, cr mm -hmm. adult with YA crossover appeal, and this general blurring of, um, I guess what we consider like strict genre lines of what mm -hmm. is considered YA. Um, I guess Chloe specifically, since I know you've written in both genres, mm -hmm. um, do you, is there like a particular difference in craft uh, of what you're writing mm -hmm. with? A more YA intention or a more adult intention, mm -hmm. um, and I guess even for the other two authors, um, since you mentioned you write middle grade as well, is there like a difference in targeting a younger demographic or an older demographic, mm -hmm. even within YA? Mm -hmm. This is a really great question. Um, it is something that we could definitely spend an hour sitting here talking about as well. I really believe there's a craft difference between young adult and adult, and it is. I, I'm almost like saddened that there is so much crossover energy happening in young adult because I think sometimes it leaves teenagers behind. Um, I think that's a market driver. I don't, you know, in no way am I saying that like these books aren't good and valuable. I really enjoy a lot of them, but I think this like chasing like upper Y is really leaving lower Y behind um, because at least in my philosophy, when I write young adult, I have a very different tone to adult. Mm -hmm. I think my style remains very similar. Like, you know, when people talk about like characters' ages or uh, things like violence and amounts of like swearing you can do, I really don't think of that as the line between young adult and adult. When I'm writing young adult, I'm thinking about what I felt as a teenager. And so much of that was thinking of the world as a very linear path. There were some lines between I need to do this to achieve this and there's this very like stable feeling almost even though you're like emotional and just learning things for the new time like for the first time right adult feels so much more expansive to me mm -hmm. because it kind of covers this like era you enter when you're 19 20 and you're like oh my god there's actually no purpose to life whatsoever I need to work it out myself <laughs> um <laughs> I feel like young adult doesn't want to embrace that as much because coming of age isn't about like, I don't know what I'm doing. Coming of age is who am I? And yeah. what is what is my purpose in this world? Mm -hmm. Adulthood is almost, fuck, there's no purpose in this world, right? <laughs> that's, that's the tone I think about when I split my like age categories up. Um, and, you know, again, this is a topic that I think we could talk about for a whole hour because there's so much nuance behind it. Um, but at the end of the day, like so much of, I think, young adult and adult today is also about audience. When I'm writing young adult, I'm writing to serve teenagers. I'm not writing for the adults, even though I would love it if they're reading my books as well. A huge part of, you know, the young adult audience is very grown adults. Mm -hmm. uh, but just first and foremost, you know, these are the books that teenagers need as they're mm -hmm. going into the world. Mm -hmm. If we take that away from them, these are very critical tools that they're going to lose out on. And, you know, where else are they going to get their little, like, life experiences? If I didn't have young adult, like, as a 16-year-old, like, I would be so sad. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's that's how I like to think about it. Yeah. 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 Um, I think about my audience at two stages. I think about my audience when I'm developing the idea. And I think about my audience when I'm in the final stages of revision. 
but when I'm drafting and in my initial revisions, I am thinking about staying true to the characters mm-hmm. and staying true to the story. Mm-hmm. And as mentioned, I'm following my own oddities and interests. Um, so I will have a sense. I'm writing a picture book. I'm writing middle grade. I'm writing YA. I'm writing this for adults because in that initial brainstorm, I've had that in mind and that shapes it. And I'm sure that intuitively I have things that I'm doing that has that audience in mind, but consciously thinking about that audience and what they need or how they will receive this or where that fits the marketplace. It does not help my process um, to think about that during. So I think about that when I'm, when I'm finessing the the final revision and that can be a moment of, of voice and of that tone and of the, that audience's expectations and reactions. And it can be, okay, because I'm coming up with a YA novel, it will have these plot elements maybe at the beginning. But during staying true to the character, staying true to the story um, is my focus. And if I let myself think about that, those other things, um, that gets overwhelming. Those fears come in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those other voices and editors uh, and opinions come in before I'm ready for them. Um, so, and because when we write for teenagers, we are usually writing about teenagers. Staying true to those teenage characters and those st- their stories will help make it more YA as well, probably. Um, but I try not to think about that too hard mm-hmm. as I'm going because letting the outside world in isn't helpful mm-hmm. to me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for these great questions. Thank you to our panelists, Chloe and Candace and Anika, for sharing you know, your process and your, your inner thoughts and everything about your books with us. Um, so we have a reception. We have, there's food in the back. There are books for sale. Are, we, are the authors supposed to stay up here at this table? Or, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 So if you want to meet the authors and get books signed, um, here they are. Um, 